And so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I always like engaging with the public and, and citizen scientists, uh, as well as professional scientists about my work. And I'll be telling you a little bit about computer designed organisms and the research program I have here at Tufts. So I'm a senior scientist in the Allen Discovery Center. I also hold a visiting scholar position at the WIS Institute at Harvard University. Um, so I'll give you an, an overview of the field and as well as my own research. And I'm gonna try to keep this fairly general. So hopefully I won't use any terminology that's confusing. If there's things or words that you don't understand, feel free to ask me about them afterwards and I'll try to clarify. But I wanted to start just by saying that there's been a, an emergence of this field of biological design. So trying to build or design biology. And there's a lot of different approaches that are currently ongoing that attack this problem from different angles. And I've tried to summarize them here, moving from left to right from sort of the most, um, the least invasive to the, the most different from a, a living system. And so developmental biology has for, for many years now tried to understand the, the signals and the movements of cells and the pathways that allow an organism to arise from an embryo. So how does, how does an organism or biological design emerge in a natural system? And so what you're seeing on the left is some frog eggs and these these, they're, they're very early in development, so they just look like round spheres, but this purple signal is the expression of different genes. So it's where genes are turned on. And by understanding where these genes are turned on, at what times uh, they're turned on, developmental biologists can create these pathways where they understand how a certain structure is regulated. So if you turn these genes on in this direction, you get a limb that forms, for example, or an eye. And that's really been super important for us to understand how you generate shape and structure in a living system. And then moving one over, regenerative medicine is really trying to turn those same pathways on in a fully differentiated system to kickstart regeneration. So if you understand the developmental biology of how a limb forms, then if you lose something like a finger and this, this mouse amputation, you could understand how to turn those genes back on to regrow that lost structure. This has been a huge goal of regenerative medicine ever since the start. Further down the line is bioengineering. So there are people who are interested in rather than working in a living system, growing organs and structures from scratch in a Petri dish. So you could imagine building a replacement cartilage for a knee or a heart valve outside of the patient and then transplanting that into the patient. And there's been a lot of movement here in the past 10 years. And they've even done things where they have these really cool organs on a chip where you have multiple different organoids present on the same interface and you can hook them together to understand how these organs interface with one another. So you can affect one system and look at the downstream effects on another one. Um, and, and more recently, this is really a field that's quite in its infancy from a scientific point of view, really only 10 years is this idea of biorobotics and that's building biologically inspired robots that contain biological components. And I'll tell you about them more in a minute, but really the other thing to highlight here is we're going from these Latin words in vivo means in a living organism to ex vivo, which means something taken out of a living organism to in vitro, which means things built in a Petri dish outside of a biological system. So this is getting more removed from a living system. So what's a bio robot? Um, I, I want you to think about a bio robot as the combination of living biological materials with inorganic components. And so generally the way that this goes is that you have an inorganic scaffold, which creates what we would call the morphology or the shape. And then you're using cells to actuate the robots or generate movement. And so think this on the top, right? This is a picture of a, a cartoon picture of something that would have a, a plastic backbone that has a neuron sitting on the top that's driving muscles and this thing can swim. But don't think about something like the Terminator. And the difference here is the biology in this one on the top is integral for the bio robot to function. Whereas with the Terminator, the skin, it's for camouflage, but really the robot functions perfectly fine without the biological components. And so this is a new field generally within five to seven years old. So most of these results are going to be quite new. The other thing that a bio robot isn't is biomimicry. So you may have heard this term a couple times as well. And that's where we emulate natural systems to solve human problems. And so, for example, on the right, we've used a lot of avians to understand aerodynamics. They're highly evolved to be very efficient and we can build uh, mechanical systems that recapitulate what we see in nature. And another fun example down here is understanding how an elephant articulates its trunk to create a robot that can more efficiently move in many, many um, degrees of freedom. And so the idea with biomimicry is that 
nature did this first, so let's use it as an example. So there are bio robots that are inspired that are biomimics, but these two things aren't necessarily the same, right? So there's no art, there's no biological materials in the stealth bomber. And what, what I think makes bio robotics really special and different from a lot of these other biological systems is developmental biology, regenerative medicine, organoids, all really aim to understand and reproduce systems that exist here on earth, right? So on the left, this is the tree of life and you have plants, animals, fungi, and protists. And generally what we study in these classical biology disciplines is trying to rebuild things that exist. But bio robots are the creation of cellular constructs built for the ground up for human purposes. So we can build things in the lab that aren't constrained in any way by this tree of life, things that don't exist in nature or couldn't produce in nature. So we can build uh, shapes and forms specific for human problems the same way we would design a robot for human problems. I just want to give you a couple examples because I think these are really cool systems and these uh, again are fairly new. And so some of the earliest examples are like this one on the left and what you're seeing here, this is from uh, the Asada lab, is a, a plasticine backbone and then this dark ring is a ring of muscle tissue that's wrapped around it. And by pulsing current in this, this aqueous media or this liquid media at different frequencies, you can generate a walking biohybrid robot. So this is uh, fairly simple conceptually, but one of the first really good examples of combining biological components with artificial scaffolds. That design was was um, sort of uh, modulated and, and changed a little bit to be able to work in different types of liquids. And that was done by now harvesting muscle from this sea slug as opposed to using rat heart muscle. And those were attached to a different form and that was able to generate this thing that was uh, modeled basically after a sea turtle. So it has these flippers in the front that it can use to move through this aquatic environment. And that's done again by pulsing electrical current. And so walking is something that's, that's really basic. Movement is a really common goal in robotics, but there's also a lot of other things to build. So you can do articulation. This is from uh, the Takuchi lab in Japan. And this has attached muscle tissue along with these, um, these artificial backbones to create an articulated limb. So by changing the voltage on the left or the right side, you can basically com compress or contract this muscle and get this articulation that you can use for different tasks. Like you can pick things up in the dish and move it around, or you could even attach different levers to get different mechanical forces. So just a very different application, but again, a type of bio hybrid robot, a robot that contains artificial and living components. Some of the most sophisticated examples that, that I personally like are from the Parker lab at, at Harvard. And there's been two main efforts that are, are really just uh, beautiful examples of biohybrid robots. So these are bio-inspired robots as well. So these are inspired by living organisms. The first is a, a biohybrid that was inspired by a jellyfish on the left. And this is a, a, an actual living jellyfish, just to show you how it moves by this radially um, contracting muscle tissue. And then you can see that they have built a synthetic version of this, which uses an artificial synthetic uh, uh, scaffold. And then on top of that was layered heart tissue that again contracts and you get a very similar forward propulsion based on the type of contraction. So that's an oversimplification of extremely complicated work. You have to layer the muscle, get it to survive, you know, uh, align it in the right direction. But this was a, a really nice medusoid biohybrid. And more recently, they have created this light controlled stingray. So this is a bio inspired design as well. That is a, um, a stingray shape made out of uh, an artificial backbone that again has muscle attached. And this muscle, rather than being directly activated by electricity, is activated by light. So when you shine light on these cells, they've been genetically programmed to contract. And by doing that, you can drive this robot around by shining lights on either the right or the left-hand side and contracting at different rates or drive it straight forward. So this is um, a really beautiful example of how you are beginning to interface biological tissues with inorganic systems. And again, to create something new, whether it's bio-inspired or not. The biohybrids have some limitations. So generally there's short lifespans if they're not bathed in, in some sort of culture media. So they need food to live. These cells have a high energy dependence and without any food over time, uh, they run out of energy and, and you lose the biological parts of the system. The cells die. The synthetic components can also show wear and tear. So that means that if, if one of the limbs of these 
scaffolds is broken off, you cannot regenerate it because it's an artificial component. You lose function in the robot pretty quickly. Um, the biological components in these biohybrids are also generally only limited to actuators. So what I mean by that is your, your motor is biological. You have contractions typically, and you're not using the biology for a whole lot else. And so we know that biological systems and cells have a rich biochemistry that can be exploited for all sorts of things, right? Making beer, making bread, you know, there's all sorts of really great um, biosynthetic pathways that you can use. And those haven't really been implemented in biohybrid designs yet. I think it's mostly because the field is new. And last, these systems still require a lot of outside input to behave. So you're sort of manually layering things, you're giving outside input, you're pulsing electricity or light. Um, and so you're not using a lot of intrinsic behaviors that the cells do on their own to, to sort of explore or move um, or process information. Um, all of these limitations are currently efforts that are underway by many labs to overcome. So these are all active areas of research. So my research program is a little bit different. I have a behavioral and developmental biology background. And my goal was really to design a fully biological robot. So this is something that has no artificial components. This is one on the right, again, of a, a synthetic backbone that's a swimmer. I, I would like to build something that has no, nothing synthetic at all, only cells. And the goals here are, are a couple fold. One is that a fully biological robot would be 100% biodegradable. So rather than leaving these artificial components around, if you have them in nature or even in, in a human patient for medicine, uh, if you built these out of cells, you could biodegrade in nature, or if you built them out of, of human mammalian cells, they could be biocompatible for human medicine. Um, the cells that uh, I would like to use would be self-powered. So this would not require <clears throat> providing culture media or adding electric currents. These are completely self-contained. And also if they're entirely biological, you could maybe get them to be self-healing. And then also beyond just the biorobotics, since these are cells doing what cells do, there's, there's a goal here that we can really understand a lot of really basic biology about how cells communicate and how, how shape is, is encoded and how to probe and, and prod cells to do what we want. And so these answer a lot of fundamental questions outside of the robotics field. However, I'll be the first to also acknowledge there's a number of disadvantages to this approach. A non-rigid skeleton can really limit the type of applications that you have. So my robots are quite soft um, and that can create some challenges. Uh, they're more difficult to build. You may have safety concerns about a fully biological robot getting loose and what it could do and also scalability. You can produce these synthetic backbones and components in mass from a, a 3D printer. And we can't really do that with cells yet. 3D bioprinters don't have that ability. <clears throat> So growing, <clears throat> growing these in mass is currently a, a big issue. So my approach was really at the beginning to simply use an organism or an early embryo of an amphibian and deconstruct the organism and then reconfigure the components to build a novel living robot. So for everything I'm going to show you today, my source is the <clears throat> developing embryo of the frog Xenopus lavis. So this is an aquatic frog it also lays eggs externally. And after they're fertilized externally, about 24 hours later, you get this ball of stem cells. <coughs> Pardon me. So they all look the same, but we have an atlas, even at this early stage, that we know if they're unperturbed, these cells from different regions on this embryo will have a fate that they become, which we can affect with molecular biology. But generally, the cells on the top either become epidermis or the central nervous system, while those... <clears throat> those on the bottom become endoderm or the organs. So <clears throat> one approach would simply be to harvest these cells from these locations, disassemble these components, and then put them back together into a novel configuration. So here I could take these green cells, which are skin, and these red cells, which are heart muscle, and build something new that is different than what the embryo was. This seems very strange from the point of view of a biologist. So taking apart an organism and putting it back together. But if you're a roboticist, this is really simple. So you can simply uh, take apart one robot, disassemble its components into actuators, scaffolds, and sensors, and build a new robot out of it. So that's the approach that we're using. 
And then also the other question is, how do you know what to build? And for that, we use simulation and computational intelligence to survey the fitness space. So this is work that was largely run by Dr. Josh Bongert and Sam Kriegman at the University of Vermont. And they have a robotics, soft body robot simulator called VoxCAD. So if you don't know what a voxel is, a voxel is just simply a three-dimensional pixel. So it's a cube, same thing that you would build things out of in Minecraft. And these cubes exist in an environment that runs physics. So there's there's gravity, if there's liquid, there's uh, liquid physics, there's surface tension, there's all, everything that you could expect in the physical environment represented in the simulator. And so we modified the voxels to represent different cell identities. So here you can see this is a simulated robot that's walking based on voxels that contract and expand at a set rate and they're set at a different um, pace and you can get this walking behavior. So we modified this program to represent different cells and the, their properties. And on top of it was layered an evolutionary algorithm, which can evolve this robot over time. So you can simply provide it with building blocks and say, here's the task I would like you to solve. And over many virtual generations, it can randomly configure these blocks in different ways to solve a problem. And I'll, I'll show you now what that looks like in practice to build a, a living robot. So to begin with, we started very simple. We used only two cell types, passive cells, which are just skin cells for us, and contractile cells, which are our cardiac muscle cells. So we've programmed how these contract and how they can uh, talk to one another. And randomly at the beginning, you produce a bunch of different designs. And you can see here that they don't really do anything interesting because they're random. This is not unexpected. But if you do this many, many thousands of times and pull the best and keep virtually reproducing them, what you get is a configuration that does a particular behavior like walking. And so then our part of the research was to figure out how to build this out of living cells. And so as I said, we start with frog eggs. So this is a one cell frog egg that was just fertilized in water. And we can inject those with RNA that affects their gene expression or turns on and off different reporters. But after 24 hours, you get this, uh, this embryo that's developing that's all just stem cells. And so it has a membrane around it that you're seeing me remove here with forceps. And then I can take from the top that uh, the polar region, this is called an animal cap, from these embryos, and give them a, a, a media change that allows these cells to be separated from this dark outer layer. And I can clean those stem cells up and then relayer them in wells from the ground up and essentially layer the different tissues like building a sandwich. And then simply swap out the media for one that lets the cells stick together and they all re-adhere into a sphere. And then 24 hours later, I can shape that sphere with a cautery electrode and a pair of surgical forceps and sculpt away the tissue to give it a final form. So here I'm putting in four small legs or protrusions on the bottom. And if you're very careful, what comes out of the other end is really a new form of living robots. So this is called by the media, the Xenobot. We call these reconfigurable organisms typically in the lab. And this is a contraction of the word Xenopus lavus, which is the species of frog that these were built from and robot. And this is a, a robot that was designed by a computer. This was created by an AI, not by nature, and then built from living cells, which I think is very powerful. And when I use this approach, these morphologies or shapes are stable for over 10 days, so they don't lose their legs or, or heal them shut. And they survive in just plain water because that's what amphibians live in. They need no additional food for those 10 days. So just like a chicken loads its, its egg with yolk, frog embryos are also loaded with yolk, but the yolk is evenly divided among all of the cells. So each of the cells here has its own internal food source that it can survive off of without needing any additional nutrients. And it's not just quadrupeds, we can build all sorts of shapes in the lab. These are just examples of, of shapes that the computer produced. And these are rough, just first pass approximations that I've built with my, in my hands in the lab uh, since then. And you also saw that there was uh, the need for these red and green tissues, this contractile and passive tissue. And we can place that very carefully as well. So on, on the top here, these green cells are just passive skin cells and these bottom cells are contractile cells. And I can recapitulate that with uh, these green labeled cells in my living organism are made from skin cells and these red cells are cardiac muscle. And so that's great. We can place the tissue, but does it actually do what we expect it to do, which is walk along a dish. So uh, to, to test that, we created this pipeline, which we've used for basically all of our studies. The pipeline is just a workflow where we provide the simulator with a goal. 
We provide it with the building blocks and we have many different building blocks we can use. There's only two here. We, we pluck out the best designs for ones that can be built. They're built or realized in the lab and then we test them. So does it work? Can, can we actually produce a living robot? So cardiac based actuation or, or muscle based movement we can use to drive walking. So this was an example of our first pilot that was built in the lab where there's some, some muscle tissue on the inside and skin on the outside just to show that this is possible. This was a refined design running in real time. So you can see the contractions happening on the posterior half here and on through the middle. And these are the limbs. And this was our final design, which is a mobile biped. So we're looking down on it from the top and you can see it walking here in a straight line over time. That's great. That's a qualitative measurement, but we've also done a bunch of quantitation as well. So you can take these and put them in a dish and run motion tracking software and follow them as they walk and you get these blue lines. When you flip the designs upside down, nothing happens, they don't move. So this isn't a random byproduct of them just having muscle tissue. And then in this graph, this is just a quantification that each of these blue lines in this graph represents a blue line from an actual walking living robot. And these pink lines represent the movement in the dish in 2D of a virtual design. So you can see when placed in a certain direction, they typically move to the right. And then if you invert them, the directionality and the magnitude is lost. And this was really where the Xenobot project first started. And this was a paper that was published in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences in 2020. Beyond walking, we've also moved to a different approach, which is swimming by using little hairs on the surface. So frog skin contains multiciliated cells, which are cells that contain a bunch of little hairs and these beat and can move fluid. And you can see those under very high magnification in one of our bots here. So this is an individual cell and that cell has about 120 to 150 individual cilium. And if you allow these to develop and beat, you can get this swimming motion. So there's no muscle in this spot. Uh, this is a, a slow-mo video of the surface and you can see here these individual cilium beating. And on the right, you can see that the combined action can drive this. Uh, this is running at 4x speed, but this is just swimming through regular water on the bench top. And these are great because both of these types of movements are very constant. We quantified this. So over the robot lifespan, they keep moving at about the same speed. You can get really interesting behaviors um, in different environments. And we've been probing a lot of these. And this was uh, uh, part of our second paper, which came out in Science Robotics. And I should also say that a lot of the work um, on the swimming robots was done by a research technician that worked under me named Emma Lederer, who was um, instrumental in pushing on this project forward. So I just want to give a summary, then I'll give three quick applications and we can wrap up and have a discussion. But, but Xenobots are fully biological living robots. They're genetically frog. These are frog cells, but we've leveraged plasticity to create something new. We've reconfigured the hardware here. We've evolved these using a simulator. We build them in the lab in about seven days and they live 10 to 12 days at a very wide variety of temperatures. And also we can build them quite large and quite small. And on the right, you're just seeing a smattering of, of the different types of things that we're able to build the, the complex shapes we can produce in the lab using this design process. So what could you use these for? I'll just, in, in a couple, be really quick. Within one Xenobot, we're trying to understand how these uh, could possibly heal and their response to injuries. Uh, at the single Xenobot level, we're looking at different movements through different environments. And at the swarm level, we're trying to use groups of these to use work in the real world. Um, so just a uh, very surface level, 10,000 foot view. Um, we know that traditional robots and biohybrids are challenged by injury and mechanical damage. But uh, self-repair is really a feature of biology. It's built in. And so what we saw is that if you injure these uh, living robots with a uh, mechanical laceration, this is a, a time-lapse video that's about 10 minutes of footage sped up, but you can see that very quickly these wounds are closed and the bot heals shut and you again regain function afterwards. And so a big part of what the lab is doing right now is to understand what is the biochemical processes that are going on that we can't see on the surface to understand um, how this repair process is being undertaken. And then we're trying to move those biochemical networks back to the simulator to have that ability in the simulator as well. So we can evolve self-healing robots and better understand how we can make robots that are robust to damage or injury over time. At the single bot level, we've been doing a lot of work looking at their movement capabilities in various environments. So we've looked at open mazes and traversing very large environments. 
we built more narrow mazes and looked at the ability to move through there and even challenge these with really small. So this is a, a half a millimeter diam inner diameter um, tube glass capillary. And so this would be the type of environment that'd be really challenging for traditional robot to move through, but we can build designs that can easily go from one end to the other. And so part and parcel with this, another active part of the lab is to, to look at not only movement, but can we have different types of stimuli around these mazes and have the robots either record information about what they sense or perhaps even do something when they sense the stimuli. Um, and that's part of ongoing work, some of which is published and some of which we're still working on. And last, we're using swarms to do different types of work. Just one example that we know about is that even very simple robots can do seemingly complex behaviors. So this is a sensorless robot that was designed uh, as part of, a, I believe, a competition that was in the University of West England, where the, this robot simply drives around. It's a physical robot, and it has these scoops on the front that are about the size of this disc. So the robot doesn't know there's other robots in the arena, what a disc is, if it's touching a disc. But just by randomly moving, sometimes by chance it collects a dish and starts put, disc and starts pushing it around. And it can push one disc and maybe two discs, but if there's a pile, the robot can't generate enough force to push it. And so over time, spontaneously, without programming to do this, you can get this aggregation behavior, this piling behavior. And so this is where we started as well. We wondered, could we do this? And so we could also layer particles in our environment. These are carmine dye particles in just a dish that's covered in gelatin. And if you place a, a, a Xenobot in there, after 10 minutes, you can see that it's, it's capable of displacing these particles. But if you place many Xenobots in and give them time, just like in those physical robots, you start to see this aggregation behavior where they're collecting particles in their environment. And this is fairly robust and we could see it happening over and over again. This is something we can model as well. So we can model robots that walk around and we can simulate types of behaviors that generate this, which looks incredibly similar to the types of behaviors that we observe in the lab as well. See, so these are those swimming Xenobots that you saw earlier. What's great is now that we can move back and forth again between simulation, we can do things like evolve designs that are better at producing this behavior. So for example, here, you can see that there are evolved designs that have these scoops on the front. Intuitively, this makes sense. It's more like a snowplow. And each of these were able to create better piles in a simple sphere. We can build these in the lab and look at, looks at what happens. And it's exactly as we would predict. So we can amplify this type of piling behavior by almost 50% simply by changing the shape. So here you can see these sort of notched uh, virtual designs. These are the ones I built in the lab. You can see here how that notch aids in particle aggregation. And down here, you're seeing that same thing that the notch essentially acts as a way to collect larger piles over time. And we've quantified that simply by measuring the, the diameter of the piles uh, in the dish at the end of the day. So that's a lot of detail. I just want to zoom out before we finish and just say there's there's a bigger picture also here that reconfigurable organisms or xenobots are, are really um, part of this biorobotics approach. And, and these all ex exist as really a sandbox technology that informs a lot of different aspects of science. So certainly from developmental biology, we're interested in how we can study cellular plasticity. We want to know how cells communicate, how they self-assemble, and how we can control assembly to guide biological design. And these are really critical for many fields, including regenerative medicine. Um, and the evolution and ecology side, there's a lot of questions about how did multicellular organisms arise? What is necessary for multicellularity? And these types of approaches are, are ways to understand how you may get from a unicellular system to a multicellular system. There's a lot of interest in basic computation at the cellular level. So how much processing can, can you do without a brain? Um, synthetic organisms like this allow for really precise cell numbers and cell types, and we can begin to tease that apart. And then last, I think computer science, right? The role that AI is, is playing in our lives and in biological design. So can AI produce a form or structure that's better than something that's been produced in evolution? So specifically for humans. So for example, if you're getting a heart transplant, we may be able to grow an exact replica of your heart, but could an AI produce a better heart for a specific patient? So based on your age, your ethnic background, your diet, perhaps there are variables that a computer could look at and produce something that is uh, uniquely tailored to your specific patient. And so AI can cross what we call fitness valleys that you could never do in the virtual world because it can do this all in simulation. 
I also want to say that beyond the science, I think what I've come to appreciate is there's a, a really beautiful artistic component to biological design. So these are just examples from things that I've produced, but these are what I consider quite striking and just amazing to look at under the microscope every day. And so I think a lot of a lot of popular press has really grabbed a hold of this because everyone sees something that they want, right? There's there's sort of the the Terminator aspect, the the creepy crawly aspect, the beautiful aspect. Um, the, the form and function. And that's led this project to really blow up on social media. And these are all things that were produced not by anyone that works in, in our laboratory, but just by fans of the Xenobot. And they run the gamut from, from the very frightening to the very cute and back again. And these were even picked up as a museum exhibit. So this exhibit closed very recently, but in the Design Museum of London, as part of the Beasley Designs of the Year, they actually ran a physical exhibit on Xenobots, which were next to architectural design, uh, clothing design, and so forth, just because simply of, of the striking nature of them. So I think all of that said, biorobotics and these approaches are, are quite inspiring and really pushing a lot of different fields forward. So I thank you all for taking the time today and for anyone viewing this video. I hope that this approach and the Xenobots and reconfigurable organisms have inspired you as well. Um, so I just wanna end by thanking uh, professionally specifically, Dr. Michael Levin, who's the director of the Allen Discovery Center and the Wiss Institute at Harvard for Biologically Inspired Design, who are, are, are two places that have allowed this to happen. And also the, the DARPA Lifetime Learning Program, which is the grant that originally uh, supported this research. And they were really instrumental in, in giving us their full support and getting behind this approach and letting us uh, take this leap to create something new. So with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has and discuss the research further.